Well, I think it's been a crazy, crazy road to get to where we are today. Uh, we've quite literally been around the world, I don't know, like, I don't know, 10 times, something like that. And, you know, I always thought that if I left my small town, kind of like your small town, I always thought that if I left my small town and my small church, I might see something that would mess up my faith, right? Uh-oh. What if I go to Africa and they don't believe in God? Or what if I go to Europe and they don't believe in God? What if... The crazy thing is, everywhere that I've traveled, everywhere I've been, over and over again, my faith has been reinforced. Because I've watched people who know Jesus Christ and who worship Him in spirit and truth. And it's an amazing thing to be able to see that everything that we talk about in our small churches, it's real. It is. It's absolutely 100% real. You know, and I, I know you may be thinking, I know there's some, probably some people out there that are a little bit progressive in thinking and all that kind of stuff, but you can call me crazy. I'm one of these guys who actually believes the Bible is true. I believe the Old Testament. I believe the New Testament. But I guess the most important reason is this. Did you know that science has never once, not once in history, not one time in history, ever proven something in the Word of God that's untrue? Not once. Did you know that? Did you know that, that in the early 1900s, there's these things that were found that were called the Dead Sea Scrolls? Now, all the scientists were excited about this because, you know, the Bible was, uh, the Old Testament was shared via word of mouth, right? And they were sure that there was going to be some mistakes that they found when they read the, old, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Crazy thing is, they opened up the Dead Sea Scrolls and 95% of the Old Testament was dead on accurate. The things that were missing were and, or, this, or that. Once again, science proves the word of God true. Did you know the New Testament? We're all worried about that. Did you know that in modern translation today, that of all the words in the New Testament, you guys have opened them, there's a few words in there, just a few. Of all the words that are there, 34 to 3,500, are the only ones that are even in dispute anymore. They all agree that they're all, that is basically a 97% accuracy rate for the New Testament. Did you clap? Science is always trying to move forward, and I know some people think, they say, they say, well, science is going to prove this, and science is going to prove that. Let me tell you something, but let me just tell you, my brothers and sisters, don't be afraid of science, because science is going to prove the Word of God true over and over and over and over again. It's a crazy thing. In the early, early parts of the, 19th, of the 20th century, they found out that the universe was not infinite forward and infinite backwards. They found out that there was actually a beginning. This is ground shattering. It was a big deal. Physicists were freaking out. Atheists were like, oh no, there's a beginning. That kind of speaks to the possibility of a creator. Oh no. The interesting thing is, I, I can sit here and say, yeah, well, we as Christians have been talking about that for the last three, four thousand years. It was in the Word of God. He spoke. Big bang. really crossed on dry land really i don't know about that that's there's no way that's possible and yet science goes up and you have these archaeologists going over there dredging the bottom of the sea and finding out that there's actually egyptian chariots in the bottom of the sea exactly as the word of god said now you may be saying jason these are a lot of ex uh, different reasons uh, to believe that the word of god is true and i do i actually wholeheartedly believe the old testament and the new testament and i know that people say it's allegorical but you know what Jesus spoke the Old Testament. He shared it a lot, which means that the Old Testament must have power as well. You know, all scripture is used for teaching, useful for teaching and for edification of the Bible. Now, with all that being said, we made a record recently. It's called the Unashamed Record. And you wouldn't believe it. When we walked in and turned in the title of the record, there were people that looked at us and like, really? Unashamed? That's what you're going to go with? Unashamed? I don't know about that. You probably are going to play foul on, with Unashamed on the title of your record. And you know what? It's what God's called us to do. He's called us to be a light into a broken world. And we're not going to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Amen. We released this record, right? We released this record. And I started writing on my hand, hashtag, I am unashamed. And then I started writing prayer requests from everybody that would meet in the autograph lines. I'd write their names on my hand because it would last three or four days. 
So I'm on a plane, we're flying from the East Coast to the West Coast. I'm exhausted, I'm tired. I walk into the plane, I sit down, and I put my headphones on, which is a universal sign of don't talk to me, I'm tired, right? And this super cool girl comes walking up with a little blue swoosh of hair. She's like, you know, 18, 19 years old. Like she's college age, she had her headphones on too, and I was like, we're gonna be chill, no big deal. Well, I'm sitting there about 10 minutes into the flight. She shuts, she kind of nudges me, I pull the headphones off, I'm like, hey, yeah, what's up? She says, what exactly does I want to shame mean? Well, it means I'm unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God for salvation should anyone believe. She said, oh. She said, what are those other names on your other hand? What are that? What's that about? So those are the people that I, I feel called to pray for because they're in a tough situation right now. She said, oh. She put her headphones back on. I thought, well, I did my part. Did exactly what God did. He opened the door and I told the truth, right? About 20 or 30 minutes passed, and all of a sudden she bumps me on the shoulder again. This time I'm sleeping. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so yeah. What you got? What's up? She goes, Would you please write my name on your hand? That's when I realized how many conversations had I missed. How many opportunities had I missed? Because I was afraid I might offend somebody. That's a crazy thing. Atheists and Christians and believers and agnostics, they will all agree with you. If you say Jesus stood for great things, he stood for awesome things that society needs, they would all say yes. But for some reason, you say the name of Jesus in America today, and it scares people. It hurts people. But let me just share with you what I believe about the Word of God. If we believe the Word of God is true, and all those stories are true, and Jesus is exactly who He says He was, if we believe those things, then we also have to deal with what comes after this life is over. And after this life is over, there are two possibilities. Number one, heaven. Number one, number two, hell, right? And if we believe what we say we believe, that no man comes to the Father except for the Son, Jesus Christ. It's kind of like the rest of the world is standing in the middle of a highway, we're all Christians, so we get to step up on the sidewalk. We're good. Nothing to worry about. About 100 yards out, there's this massive Mack truck running 90 miles an hour down the highway. It's about to mow down the rest of the world. And we as believers, we get a choice. Our choice is to step back and put our hands in our pockets because we're afraid that we're going to hurt somebody's feelings. Or say, hey, there's a truck coming. Get out of the road. And I cannot believe how many people would rather see people get mowed down than actually tell the truth. My son reaches out to touch the oven and it's hot. You know what I do? I swat his hand because I don't want him to get hurt. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that we as a church, we have a responsibility. It's not because we're better than anybody else, but it's because we believe what we say we believe. We believe that the Son of God is Jesus Christ and that there's hope in Jesus Christ. There's hope for not just this life, but for the life that is to come. And that means that we have to stand up and we have to speak out about the truth that we know. Stand on their boxes. I'm, not, I'm sure that happens here. It happens in my hometown. There's a guy who stands on the corner of, of our square that's weird and messed up. And he screams, Hey, you're going to hell! And that really works. <laughs> and I want to tell say, Dude, you're missing it. Like you have to wait for God to open the door because the Holy Spirit will draw man's heart. But we don't to be screaming at people saying, You're stupid, you're wrong, you're going to hell. We need to be waiting for the opportunity to share with, with our lives and then beyond that with our words, no matter what it may cost us. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the church to stand up. So would you repeat that for me? Say, I am unashamed. I am unashamed. Say, I am unashamed of the gospel. I am unashamed of the gospel. Say, I
Raise your phone and lift the roof off of this place with your voices. One, two. 